Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jesse Fergali, and you're listening to Working Capital, the real estate podcast. My special guest today is Jim Clayton. Jim is the director and Timothy R. Price chair at the Brookfield Center in Real Estate and Infrastructure, and that is at the Schulich School of Business here in Toronto, Canada, and that is at York University. Jim, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me, Jesse. And that was a big mouthful. <laughs> yeah, we thought we'd, we'd uh, like we talked about before the show, we'd kind of break it down because you've got quite an extensive background in real estate. And before I start, uh, York University at the Schulich School of Business, how long uh, have you been at that post? I've been here just over four years. I came in 2018 and uh, partly because um, Schulich School received some funding to create the Brookfield Center in both real estate and infrastructure, which is kind of unique. And, and also, um, it's just kind of time to come home. I grew up in Toronto, uh, moved away, told my mother-in-law I was taking her daughter um, in 1988 away for a one-year master's to UBC. And 30 years later, we moved back after 20 of those in the States. That's fantastic. That's another uh... A uh, really good uh, school for real estate as well. University of British Columbia's program there. It's um, Sauter Sauter School of Business, if I have that correct. You got it. It was uh, really the only place one could kind of end up if you wanted uh, graduate education in real estate at that time. Right on. Well, um, you know, once again, thanks for coming on. Part of the reason I thought listeners would get a lot of value about having you on was um, just some of the research themes that you've been working on. Um, and we'll jump into them. I think, uh, you know, just to kind of uh, telegraph this a little bit, it's going to be a little bit about kind of the the trend in real estate and commercial real estate in general, uh, where we've gone from institutional investors and private investors. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the paper that you did that was on the uh, uh, the impact on real estate decisions in relation to climate change or climate concerns, which is, I mean, definitely topical now in Canada and the U.S. and globally. Um, but before we start that, maybe you could give uh, listeners a little bit of uh, your background, how you, you know, wound up in in this uh, in this industry, because like I said, you have quite the storied uh, bio. Oh, sh sure. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity, Jesse. Yeah. So um, it's it, it comes from the family uh, bloodline, if you will, to some extent. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad uh, worked for quite a while for CMHC and got moved around from Ottawa to Winnipeg, back to Ottawa, and then he decided to go out on his own and have his own real estate consulting firm and moved to Toronto in the in the 60s. And, uh, you know, fast forward many decades later, and he he sold his company Clayton Research Associates uh, to Altus that you'll be familiar with here. And, yep. and he's still he's still involved in uh, in real estate at a, at a research center for uh, at Ryerson University. And I noticed that we don't we don't retire in this industry. No, no, no. We keep trying to contribute, especially when you've got something to say on the policy side. So um, I just was always growing up, always interested in, in cities. I, I love being in Toronto. I grew up in Scarborough. Uh, you know, they, uh, I was just curious about them. Ended up doing an economics degree and uh, was a little disappointed that the urban economics class got canceled when I was at Western. So kept looking for graduate education, tried to go to Wisconsin, but unfortunately, uh, James Grasscamp, that was a pioneer of academic real estate there, passed away that summer, and I ended up going west to, to UBC, and it, it was a great time. Went to do a one-year master's, but decided to just keep going, and got my PhD. Some great people to work with there, including the current dean, uh, Bob Helsley, and Will Strange, who's at U of T now, and, and it wasn't a bad place to live for five years with Whistler to the north and a few other things. But once graduated, when you graduate uh, with a PhD, if you want to be in the teaching side, you, you you have to leave and go to a different school. Not a lot of opportunity in Canada. I was fortunate. I ended up in Halifax on the other coast, St. Hmm. Mary's University. Um, eventually ended up at the University of Cincinnati, um, down in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, because they had, a, they had two really strong academic researchers that both were very connected to industry. Uh, David Geltner, who's now at MIT, and Norm Miller that set up the program uh, recently. Uh, he's at University of San Diego. Both of them are sort of stepping back, but that was kind of a, a great experience for me for eight years, but I uh, always had my head in kind of the real world and interesting, as you said, the institutional world. In the early 90s, I actually got some research funding from a, a group here that involved uh, number of the, the, you know, the Moorgards and the Prudentials and, and, and the like, and met Andre Kuzmicki, 
a uh, name that many of your folks may know who, who ultimately also ended up at York University and, and helped bring me here. Um, just, just really enjoyed that part. And I, so I transitioned to kind of a hybrid role, if you will, will at the Pension Real Estate Association. Um, meant to move to Hartford, Connecticut, but it meant that I was working in a research education role directly with the institutional investors, the major pension funds and the investment managers. Um, after, after a few years there, I, I had got a little itchy and actually got the opportunity to join one of the members on the investment management side. And luckily it was in Hartford because my wife had had enough of moving every five, five years with, uh, with a couple of kids in, in tow. Um, so I had a great experience. I got the opportunity to join um, the real estate equity arm of Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company at the time called Cornerstone Real Estate Advisors, now, now part of the Barings uh, Behemoth Multi Asset Class a group, where Mass Mutual eventually merged all its five different investment management companies and different asset classes into one one big one big group. But so kids grew up, moved away, live in good cities in the in the U.S. For any of your southern <laughs> listeners, uh, Denver and Seattle, and my wife and I are like, why why are we in Hartford, Connecticut? And let's uh, look at there's an opportunity in Toronto. Come back and be with family and join join Shula and get back into the teaching and research world. So it's terrific. I can still do both. Lots of industry partners um, and uh, really enjoying it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's common uh, when you're, uh, you know, it's, we have beautiful Februarys here. Why not just move back to Toronto? Uh, but um, <laughs> I, love, I love winter. <laughs> you, you know what? Me too. It's uh, it makes the, uh, the other seasons uh, I feel more special, but uh, you know, the funny thing with, uh, for those that don't know in Toronto, we're getting into the uh, thick of it. And once we get in June, July, it, people don't realize how hot it is, especially down by the water here. And it, uh, if people in our industry, especially if you're wearing suits, tours they get uh they get pretty uh you got to be pretty strategic about them <laughs> so when you're at um uh so is it bearings now and it was formerly cornerstone yep and i i think uh i was reading you're the head of uh, investment strategy there so were you playing a somewhat of, of a kind of a, a an economist role were you playing more of an investment uh like a more on the um the kind of allocation of what they were doing, a consulting role, how, like how did that work out? I'm always interested in ec uh, academics working in in industry, which I find is a little bit more common in our world. Yeah, that's 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 a great question. And the interesting part, Jesse, is that you can, in many ways, depending on how, how it works out, you can kind of invent to some extent a, a role that uh, that bridges some some areas. So it was kind of all of the. Above, there was an economics capital markets component to it, helping run uh, the house view that a lot of folks have with, you know, maintaining uh, a lot of discussion between the different groups on the both the investment and the lending side. What's everybody thinking? Um, what, what's the latest reading of the tea leaves from a pure economics perspective? Where are we seeing things all, all the way down to set, trying to help set strategy for specific separate accounts for the open ended fund? coming up with ideas for the new closed end funds that were going out there. And then a lot of client communication, um, answering questions, doing ad hoc projects for them. Um, the biggest part was probably maintaining sort of the, the, the house view and keeping everybody informed, but that client interaction and working with our portfolio managers, I, I really enjoyed as, as well. Cause all, a lot of that is um, I call it either, you know, myth busting or looking under the hood. Um, a lot of a lot of times we tend to make generalities and make make statements based on past relationships. But as you know, the, the world is uh, dramatically changing, always evolving, especially with the long term forces. Yeah, no, that certainly makes sense. And one thing I found interesting to get your take on it is uh, over the last, I, I don't know, probably, you know, five, 10 years, especially, but even beyond that, there were certainly beyond that, there weren't as many schools that, you know, specialize in real estate, whether you were in the States or in, in uh, Canada, um, you know, you have the big ones, you know, Wharton, we were just talking about Peter Lindemann and where there's some pioneering uh, courses and specializations. Uh, but how have you seen, how have you, how have you seen real estate education evolved uh, over your tenure uh, in, in academia and, and what you're doing today at Schulich? That's, that's a great, it's a great question. So it's, there's a, there's a number of different approaches you can, you can take. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see what folks have tried to do. As you, as everybody is aware, real estate's an incredibly multidisciplinary area. And it's almost, 
I mean, it's almost impossible to try and do everything. So we're, we're in a business school, so you're going to have a business focus. And historically, a lot of schools have had sort of the finance and investment focus. And maybe, you know, there's a course or two, maybe three. And the ones that have the opportunity to go a bit bigger also spend a lot of time. So one of the things I love that we do is we don't just teach the finance, but we teach how do you think about where the numbers come from? Um, econo urban economics, we call it econo economic forces in the city. Um, you need to get into design, planning. It's not, it's not always easy to do when you're in a business school. You can, you can do guest speakers. You can, you can have faculty that come from those backgrounds. So what works really well is blending some academic content with really sharp practitioners from different areas. And the thing is to make sure everybody's on the same page so that when we, and then we have a, the, a, the biggest thing that I think benefits so many real estate programs and is the fact that the industry just seems, whether it's alumni or industry partners, they seem to give back and they understand what's needed. And it allows for a really enhanced co-curricular outside the classroom experience, um, whether that's with men mentorship program, but in the learning, we have a developer's den case competition, try and send students to other case competitions, ULI, join with, maybe join with some students from another school, from the planning department, architecture department, get that teamwork going together, and then, and then work with folks um, from a diversity of backgrounds. And then the other thing is you have to find a way to differentiate yourself. And what, what uh, happened at Shulik is that the James McKellar that helped start up the program here, he's actually an architect by background. So that was kind of instilled in him. And then Andre Kazmicki that came on was came from the institutional capital side. And so you've got those blends, but then the infrastructure component got added for, for two reasons, both, both because of the real asset adoption of a lot of the pension funds, major institutional investors, and now investment managers they are following that, uh, you know, that, that alternatives group includes real assets and real estate and now infrastructure and more, but also because a lot of what we're really doing is the business of cities, if you will. And cities are not just real estate. They're, if we say cities are real estate infrastructure and people. Um, so it's kind of a, an interesting dichotomy, but, and you've got people trying to figure out all different parts of that in terms of how, how they deliver the product. Yeah. I love that. We, um, I'm sure I mentioned on the, on the, uh, on the show before i'm not sure if you've read the book by edward glazer triumph of the city um yeah, yeah. I, I think he's is he at harvard i i don't think it's yeah. the business school right it's the yeah. is it the business school um he's in economics he's okay in the economics yeah yeah he's an yeah. urban urban yeah. economist as yeah. well so i guess the um the trend that we're seeing in real estate well first of all one thing i loved about i i actually was doing an mba somewhere else but i took the the uh fine real estate finance course at Schulich. Uh, with our friend uh, Alan, and what I what I loved about the course, even though I've, you know I did different economics and finance courses throughout uh, my undergrad and and um, post grad, I found this was the first time we were really looking at okay, here's an industrial building, here are the inputs, here are your recoveries, and you're actually doing a tangible, real life, you know, real world example uh, mm -hmm. of what you might be doing when you when you graduate when you leave the school. Um, I wanted to get your take on the trends that we're seeing in some areas. Um, I call it the, uh, the um, you know, I think it's um, the Samuelization of uh, Paul Samuelson from uh, uh, noted economist uh, that I believe won the um, Nobel Prize in economics, but the, mathemat the mathematization of economics and how we're seeing a trend that going, you know, to numbers. And I, I, I worry that we're losing the, the actual tangible um, intuition and a lot of the, the stuff that you don't see in the data. Do you, do you see trends that it's, that are going one way or the other when it comes to real estate or finance? That's, that's really interesting. You say that Jesse, because I, I think that's sort of exactly what happened leading up to the financial crisis that, uh, and there, it, at one point in time, you, you weren't allowed to talk about, uh, you know, human behavior and psychology mixed together with economics and finance, it was all about the numbers. I think it has. I think it has changed. The numbers still matter. Um, I'm, I'm kind of smiling. You can't see it because I'm teaching a capstone class right now, where where we um, talk about kind of way, way, ways to rethink things. Um, and 
mo different models and, and combining things from different fields to make innovation. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, it's one of the papers that the students will read is actually from Andrew Lowe at MIT. And I think it's called Bubble Rubble Finance in Trouble from a few years ago, where he references Paul Samuelson's thesis and, and subsequent papers that became Nobel Peace Prize that that everything and he kind of argued that yeah we we turned it into physics we tried to mm. turn economics into physics yeah. where really it should be adaptive biology and yeah. people huh. learn and 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 not and, and I'm laughing because that's how I teach about, about cities the system of cities follows nature patterns in terms of mm. the number of big versus number of small and how they're related to each other and how people adapt and change over time. So I think there's almost more of a, a, a biology, evolutionary biology element to that. And that brings in changing behavior and learning and, and things. So it, it is really kind of interesting. And then, although the thing that I, it's funny because uh, economics, when we learn it, we all learn about this utility function and all, all the math and and uh but nobody really talks about that too much later on in 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 life and it's uh yeah it's it's, it's quite interesting the one thing i think we don't talk enough about and is also is, is simply demographics mm. yeah it's funny like the first you, you get to economics 101 and you're talking about utils and you're talking you know how what where can we quantify your your contentment or your happiness and yeah you know, it's, uh, I know it's, he's, he writes controversially, controversially, but um, uh, Nicholas, uh, sorry, Nassim Nicholas Taleb talks about this a little bit in that if you really look at the math that we're using in economics, it's, it's really, like you said, it's, it's math that is used for kind of like 18th, 19th century physics, not even, you know, the, like you said, the, the, and it's not, it's, it's not to say that the it, we just need to use better math it's the fact that they it's almost too complex the complexity is too large in in human action and human decisions to try to capture it with just um you know in the same way we captured nature so i wanted to get your thoughts on that just because i i see that as a trend and it's probably because for those that are interested at all in this uh there's a great uh, BBC um, documentary called uh, the Midas formula, and it talks about the Black-Scholes equation and long-term capital management's, you know, explosion. And basically the upshot is we had a lot of very, very smart people um, thinking that we could just break everything down to, uh, you know, the numbers. And then what they didn't realize were these events that you, you really... Uh, the crazy part is if there was somebody that was there with the kind of intuition that had been in the industry, that might have been the solution rather than yeah. relying on the math. Yeah, that's true. And interestingly enough, if they had kept more of their money on their books and not gave it back to their investors, they would have survived. Yeah, well, yeah, there you go. Um, so I want to I want to talk about this, which I don't think we talk about enough in our industry. And, and it's not it's not in a political sense, but in real world decisions. Um, how climate models and maybe for, you know, for a, a little bit of context, how, you know, the intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change, the IP, IPCC reports, how those are informing real estate decisions, if they are informing real estate de uh, decisions. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the paper that you did and, and, and maybe some of the findings um, that, that you, you reached. Yeah, be, be happy to. So the paper you're referring to, there's been a few different sort of iterations and, and, and versions. And it all, it all started, um, uh, I guess, a little over a year ago, uh, maybe even a little bit longer than that, that I got, I got connected with uh, Matthew Alterno at uh, the United Nations Environmental Program, finan financial institutions, essentially. It was um, really, really focused from the financial institution perspective on starting to think about understanding the implications of climate risk for financial and asset modeling on the, the real estate side. And, and they had done some studies with some of the providers that are out there now, that a lot of action going on with firms that are modeling um, climate risk, but it was kind of a future look within a black box that they didn't really understand sort of where, what was informing how these empirical models were formed. So actually approached um, myself and we connected with a, a group of folks from the University of Reading 
uh, Henley School of Business in the, in the real estate program there that um, uh, Sarah Sace in particular had been doing, focusing on ESG. And, and, uh, and, and so the four of us actually sort of were charged with simply going back and seeing what's even out there in the literature. What, what does the academic literature have to say about the implications of climate related events on, on property values? What's, what's, the, what's the impact? Is it transitory or permanent? How does it tend to work? And not surprisingly, there's been a lot of studies historically about floods and about other things before anybody was really thinking about climate risk. But at the same time, ever since Hurricane Sandy, and especially which is coming up on a decade now, this, this coming fall, and then really within the last five years as well, there's been a, a, a real move uh, to this becoming not sort of a backwards looking, let's look at specific events. It's becoming part of mainstream finance and economics. Uh, the Review of Financial Studies, one of the big finance publications, one of the top tier journals, like the Journal of Finance and Journal of Financial Economics, they actually did a, a special climate related issue, call for papers, things that, that, that came out uh, not that long ago. So the whole world has is, is kind of changed. That special issue had three articles in there about real estate related, specifically house prices. Um, and, and interestingly enough, with sea level rise. So now we're starting to think more about forward looking. Nothing's happened yet, per se, but not necessarily related to events. But at the same time, we're starting to be able to see that uh, and test whether sea level rise, if you can sort of gauge different metrics in terms of risk, um, what that might be doing as well. Almost all of the literature is owner occupied residential, oftentimes associated with nice locations on the ocean that have amenities. So it's a little tough to tease out the amenity versus now the increasing disamenity. But we're starting to see more commercial real estate, income property, institutional property, some good work done uh, by some researchers on, on the impact with uh, real capital analytics data and, and some others on, on the impact of Sandy on not, not only New York, but on Boston and Chicago prices. So is did investors, even though it did not get to Boston, did investors start to get concerned up there? And Chicago was more of a placebo test. Um, so you're starting to see some things like that and some interesting things coming out on the lending side as, as well. So it has, and I'm happy to talk also about what I'm sort of seeing from the investment committee um, perspective in, in, as well. Yeah, I think the what what I found interesting there was uh, in the paper anticipated effects on commercial real estate performance, and you know just seeing it here, there was effects on cash flow, effects on capitalization rates, uh, and effects on financing. And I always thought, you know, there's this there's in our industry, I find that there's usually two buckets of of people, the people's outlook on ESG. Um, which is, uh, you know, environmental, sustainable and governance. And, you know, some people think it's, it's just, uh, uh, window dressing and others are, are fully committed to it. And really what I always thought that from a climate perspective, if it was going to affect decisions, the rubber was going to meet the road on the financing side, uh, when lenders said, you know, this area, there's going to be a premium because of X is, is that where you see potentially the, the decision-making um, implications, or is there some other area that that it's more pronounced? I, I, I for, it, for a certain part of the market, um, definitely on the financing side, and, and you could add insurance hmm. to that as as well. For the more for the more institutional side, I think they're being more proactive and thinking not only about those things that, but also thinking about liquidity implications down the road at exit. Um, you're starting to see if you have a short horizon. You know, Mark, Mark Carney has that great quote from his, his uh, talk at Lloyd's of, of London and his, in his book as well about the tragedy of the horizon. These are really long term issues. But if you have a short term window and you can do something and get in and get out, you're probably not too worried. But the, I think the idea is that eventually that game of musical chairs, the getting out will eventually be tougher because the folks that want to buy and hold, they're, they're going to start redlining some areas that have not either adapted um, in some way, and then it's gonna be more expensive to own that.
property, depending on property taxes, insurance, and other things. Um, but I, th I think there's a concern there on the whole liquidity and exit. And in fact, I mean, uh, now I, I've seen cases where certain institutional investors have, have already declared that they aren't going to certain states, hmm. um, no, no matter what. Now, well, those states also happen to be the ones with the highest net in migration of people since COVID. So the economic <laughs> fundamentals yeah. might not support that fully. But and on the financing side, you are seeing it. And it's easier to see evidence of this in the states um, because of that extent of securitization on, on the mortgage market. So um, there's a really interesting study that recently got published that uh, by Matthew Kahn and, and co-author that that looks at, at what happens to um, more what happens on the lending side after major hurricanes in terms of the types of loans that are originated, and more and more what happens is that that lenders start switching to loans that could go into securitized pools, hmm. so they're starting to get ready in case they have to uh, sell off those mortgages, and you see the same thing with some some banks down in Florida in, a, in another study. So I remember uh, just coming to mind that in another uh, Canadian university, University of Guelph, which was one of the uh, schools that uh, that had a, uh, I believe one of the first in Canada that had a kind of an exclusive real, uh, real estate program in the business school. But I remember there was a professor there, the name escapes me, that um, talked a lot about or studied uh, climate uh, impacts and, and economics. And is the calculus still the same in terms of how we mitigate this is we're looking at parts per million and like from, from the perspective of, I think it was either cap and trade or you would have, what's the other alternative to dealing with, uh, with, uh, with climate in terms of uh, tax and climate or, or polluters? Um, well, yeah, I mean, you could just price, you could price your carbon footprint and i guess yeah. what's happening now is the regulation to net zero um that it has become more severe south of the border and, and is i think more naturally being adopted up here mm. by targets by a number of firms with an impact framework so what i was sorry we tried to get at there was um carbon tax uh where that was like the leading model of how how you would kind of deal with this uh this aspect but i think from from the real estate perspective the so the like we just kind of alluded to it there the coastal uh, states or you know areas that you see lenders starting to prepare for that ability to have to put uh, debt into pooled funds I'm assuming that gives them that flexibility in case there is an an event um, that would negatively imp, imp, implicate their loans. Yeah, and but but you would think that eventually the folks that are analyzing those pools of loans are going to catch on. And, and that will be tougher and tougher mm. to do, um, <laughs> I would think. Yeah, I can imagine. Okay, that's great. Well, I think um, in terms of the, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, the courses that you teach at Schulich, because I think it, it ties, uh, I want to be mindful of the time, and I think it ties well with um, kind of the theme in terms of people listening that are either investors or uh, individuals that want to get into the industry. And there's a course I believe you teach, and it's, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's leadership in real estate? Yeah, yes, we do. I have a leadership course, yep. So in general, leadership in real estate, what what have you seen over, uh, over your career in terms of, uh, I think you talked a little bit about how we, we tend to give back as we get older into, our, into the industry, which I find is not, is not, is not really uh, similar across the boards in, in every industry. And yeah. I feel like there's almost a badge of honor when you're at that, you know, 60s, 70s of giving back to younger uh, uh, individuals like myself or younger than myself. But um, how do you think leadership is different in real estate, if at all, than other industries? And how has how, how has your experience uh, informed uh, the way you look at leadership in our in our field? It's not, so the, I, I would honestly say viewing leadership from both the way it's taught and viewing it within companies is relatively new to me because I was, I saw some leadership, but I was all, mostly an academic and you're kind of a sole proprietor as long as you're, you know, you've got to work as a group, you've got good people, it, it all works, but you're really focused on your research and your, your teaching. And then I, I witnessed different types of leadership when I was in the corporate world. So, um, and, and some of it, some of it, not so good in the sense that, uh, these days, you, you cannot be vertical, I don't think. You cannot be siloed. But 
the, on the academic side, where that leadership class comes in um, is our one-year master's program that's relatively new in the, in the fifth year. The traditional student doing the MBA like you did, Jesse, you get, you get access to that full round of courses, including leadership change management um, strategy, if you want to go that way. So what the leadership class is, and it kind of goes back to your physics uh, question or discussion, is that we're going to do a one-year master's program. We won't want to have technocrats. We want to have that element to it where we still have the people skills. We understand how the world works. Uh, we have good communication skills. We understand change management, you know, re reframing, stretch benchmarking, all, all that aspects of it with the uh, thinking about the world and, and really dealing with innovation um, it comes into our capstone class as well. And then bringing that back to the real estate. But it's interesting though, this summer, um, so I, I co-teach that class with, with, uh, with Sam Al Hussein, who's a co co-head of the MBA program and very involved on the strategy side. And then in the summer though, we actually spend a lot of time with leaders. Um, and what we're seeing is that a lot more of the leaders are focused that, that we seem to be spending time with are really focused on the broader community and longer term view. Now that might just be Toronto. Um, they're really focused on the S in the ESG or the broader impacts of all three of those within an impact framework. Um, and, and so, we, we're for example, we spend the, tomorrow will be uh, downtown in Regent Park, Toronto, um, at the World Urban Pavilion with uh, uh, Mitchell Cohen, CEO and president of Daniels Corporation. Hmm. Um, yeah. The C, you know, so and then CEO of uh, Ian, Ian Underwood, CEO of uh, Habitat for Humanity, Greater Toronto, doing really interesting things on the housing affordability provision um, here at Toronto. You know, so we're, and and also. Uh, related to that aspect of it, it's it's the folks that also have a different vision um, in terms of helping solve some of the city's problems, if you if you will, as opposed to coming in and talking about the IRR. Yeah, that's a perfect contrast right there. Uh, and um, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about um, maybe the impact on the IRR of where the current environment that we're in. So Q2 2022. Um, it looks like we're going to get a, um, a interest rates are going to continue to go up. We're in kind of a weird environment right now where we've had what, you know, technically a recession because of COVID, but really more like a natural uh, phenomenon, like a, you know, a natural disaster. Uh, we were kind of jolted into um, a recessionary environment. Now that we are out of it um, in employment is low in both the States and Canada. And now we're looking down the barrel of what happens in the next say 12 to 24 months. Uh, what's your view on on how this this kind of can potentially unfold over the next uh, short, relatively short term? There, there sure is a lot of uncertainty related to a lot of things and you throw in, especially the, the nature of how we're all going to work and whether it's like this, we're hybrid, where I think you're probably home, I'm at work, but I'm usually at home and not often at work, you know, that 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 nature. But I, I, I think in a lot of, I think we're in for a bit of a bumpy ride over the next 12 months or so. Um, I don't see, we've got a lot, you mentioned strange times, strange things going on. We're, we're in an incredibly, uh, we're, we have this major affordability, unaffordability issue in Toronto. I, I think that's actually a good thing that we've got some natural market forces slowing. I don't think we're pricking any bubbles or anything of that sort. I think we've got too much demand. I think we've got some natural forces at work with the capital markets and let's and and people migrating to lower cost areas. And, and this may be very healthy for places like Halifax, good for Montreal, maybe even some other places outside of, of Toronto to sort of have a chance to think about how all this, this works together. Um, I, I don't, I'm, pretty darn positive um, on, on where things are going, but we certainly have some challenges. We also have a lot of risks going on with an election coming coming up. Um, yeah. We know how policies can change very, very quickly if something happens that somebody else come comes in. Um, yeah, I'm not, not sure I really answered your, your question all, all that No, well. I, I mean, it's one <laughs> of those things. I, I, I try to crystal 
crystal ball my uh my guests and it's it's just interesting to see different different responses i guess the you know i'd love to get you back on where we could talk a little bit more in depth we didn't really get to uh some of the kind of uh, financial and institutional stuff um but just on the the interest rate uh environment like what we have found is that uh pro- properties that you know say we mortgages five-year mortgages uh ten-year mortgages that are coming due or refinances are happening the loan to value is, is not really the, the the litmus test anymore. It's the debt service coverage, right? It's yeah. because interest rates have, you know, 2.53% and now, you know, we're at six potentially more uh, for certain types of mortgages. Um, do you think that that implication is going to uh, do what recessions typically do or, or t- the, uh, austerity typically does for the investment community? It kind of weeds out the, the ones that you got over their skis a little bit. Um, do you have a view on that? Um, well, I I think I think one always has to be very careful with financial leverage and make it very very strategic as opposed to just what's the maximum that a lender will give me, hmm. and 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 go do that. It's it's not only the rates per se, right? It's all the covenants and the bells and whistles and the, the flexibility that you might have. So if you're if if you've taken on what might be a bit too much, um, depending on your property situation, then yeah, I think uh, there could be the odd opportunity for those for those things, or, or you better find some friendly long-term equity partners to help you out for the next little while. Um, I, but but I, I I think the other option might be to try and see if there's some more favorable short-term financing that might get you through this with some more flexibility and, and more options. That uh, especially if you have some value-add opportunities. On, on your property, because the, the only way that you're going to offset the negative impact of that denominator going up on your valuations is to think about how you can improve the numerator. Um, and and may, maybe that is more, you know, more, more value add, shorter term, that type of financing. Maybe not. We're, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. And the, the big question, on every, as everybody's discussing, is, is, is this really a, a, a a ramp up a permanent shift in our inflationary environment or two years from now, are we going to be back to where we are with the long-term trends and demographics and, and the like? Yeah. I think the world? Tr- transitory is, is the word of the, uh, seems like the word of the, uh, the year. Uh, on the yeah. It followed on, it followed on pivot last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, that's great. Uh, before, um, before we kind of wrap up here, um, are there any resources that you're, currently um, delving into whether it's books, podcasts that you think would, um, you know, listeners would get, uh, get some value out of. Interesting that you say that. So there's, there's actually some, um, I'll follow up with you, Jesse, and send you a few that I have from a a few classes um, specifically, but so in addition to our leadership class, we, our capstone class is a major project, but we have a creative component to that, a creative workshop where we try and uh, sort of, you know, get, get, get students thinking about innovation, um, thinking about rethinking, if you will. And, and that word rethinking, um, I, I'm reading um, Adam Grant, Think Again. Hmm. I don't know if you've read that. I found that incredibly in- interesting. And I've gone back and uh, actually the students are, are watching one of his TED Talks on the surprising habits of original thinkers. From his other book. I was like, I, yeah, because yeah. I, I was like Adam Grant. I knew, uh, I think the yeah. book, the original, it was called the originals, right? The, yeah, his, you, his got, great, you, yeah, great you got book. it. And his first one was givers and takers, which is is, is kind of how we try and groom our students. Be a, be a giver, not a, not, yeah. not a taker and, yeah. uh, and, 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 and look behind you. It's um, I, I'm, I'm really enjoying um, kind of reading that because it's it gives you different ways to think about things and it it puts people into these buckets that uh, you, you uh, and it goes back to some of what you were saying earlier about uh, you don't want to, you know, you could be a, a preacher or a prosecutor um, and, and uh, you know, with your ideas, but you get you got to be you got to be flexible and realize that you don't know everything. And uh, I find that one very interesting. Awesome. Well, you said it better than I did. Um, Jim, for, uh, for individuals that are just interested in reaching out or kind of, uh, even the program interested in, in learning more about the, uh, the program that you teach or the MBA, uh, in general, where, uh, where can we send them to? We'll put it in the show notes. Oh, I, you can give them my email address if you want, or I'll, or I'll send, send you to the, uh, the website for the MREI, um, or the Brookfield center on, honestly, they they, they need some work. 
And uh, I've been. <laughs> what, ed- what, uh, I don't know, one uh, academic institution I went to that uh, the website didn't need a little work. <laughs> My guest today has been Jim Clayton. Jim, thanks for being part of Working Capital. Thank you, Jesse. I really enjoyed myself and appreciate the opportunity.